Welcome everyone to another episode of Tell a Friend. In today's episode, I feature an interview with someone who I deem to be an icon and a great source of inspiration, Barbara Blake Hanna. She's a Jamaican author, music journalist, and filmmaker. She came to Britain in 1964 and just four years later, went on to make history as the first black television journalist in Britain. Throughout her journalistic career, she interviewed Prime Minister Harold Wilson and Michael Caine. She went on to pave the way for the likes of Moira Stewart and Trevor MacDonald. In our long-ranging interview, we discuss everything from her life and career in the media to what she thinks about the broadcasting scene today. This is my interview with Barbara Blake Hanna. Could you begin by describing your arrival to Britain and telling me what your first ex in initial reaction to Britain was? Well, actually, I was living in Jamaica working as a journalist with a PR company when a friend of mine, a girlfriend of mine named Beverly Anderson, who later became the prime minister's wife, but she was then working with a television company and a film, she was trying to find extras for a movie that was being filmed in Jamaica. The film was called A High Wind in Jamaica. Very nice, start Anthony Quinn, among other people. Very excellent film. And they needed extras, so she got me a job, Spanish speaking extras, I spoke Spanish. She got me a job on the film, and while I was working on it, just as an extra, um, the director's wife said, we need some people who are willing to come to England and be extras when we shoot in the studio. Would you like to be one of them? And of course I said yes, because everybody was trying to get to England in the 60s. We'd just become independent in Jamaica. We all had, we were British though, we all had British passports. So I said yes, and I came to England on such a trip. There were three of us, Beverly Anderson, myself, and an actress named Maud Fuller. And we came, they put us up for a few days in a hotel in, in Knightsbridge, but then we were on our own and then they filmed and we, you know, the filming was over. I just realized I never wanted to be a movie star. And then we were there in London. Beverly had a sister who had a flat in London and we went and shared with her. Um, and then began the business of trying to find somewhere of my own to live. And there began the whole history of being black in Britain, you know, because accommodation was really, really hard for those of us with skin this color. We were just not accepted. It was very difficult to find accommodation. You had to live somewhere really, really awful places. I mean, then Notting Hill Gate was the place to look first. Notting Hill and Brixton were Notting Hill this side of the river. And it was Notting Hill Gate, Ladbroke Grove was just derelict buildings. Buildings with, you know, rotting masonry and garbage in the front yard and people rented out rooms that, you know, had peeling wallpaper and bad plumbing if it had any at all. But that's what we could have. And I shared, we didn't, we shared with Beverly and her sister for a while. And after trudging around the real estate companies and not getting anywhere, I finally got lucky because one of the actors on the film asked the landlady in the block he was living in, in Earl's Court, if she would rent a room to a decent young lady. And despite all her misgivings, when she saw me and saw that I looked more or less presentable, didn't look like I was a, a, a street lady. <laughs> I got a place to rent for, of my own. It was just a bed sitter, one room with a little bath attached and a gas fire. And there I lived for quite a while. That was the start of trying to find good accommodation. I ended up having a really nice flat on Chepstow Road, which was still the ghetto. Now it's very, you know, posh. The whole of Notting Hill has totally changed. But in those days, it was just black people and people who didn't mind having black people living close. Um, Lad Road, Portobello Road was right there. And I could buy plantains and green bananas and patties, sweet potato, chocho in the market. And as a young lady, I also liked the other half of Portobello Road where 
I had a, a thing about um, um, vintage clothing, vintage dresses. It was the time, it was swinging 60s. And I used to find nice garments in, on the racks on the other half of Portobello Road. So we lived, I, I had secretarial skills. And uh, so I had myself out as a temporary secretary and worked that way for quite a couple of years, you know, earned my living as a secretary. Um, eventually I got a job as a secretary with a PR company that handled the public relations for Jamaica and the Jamaican government, Jamaica Tourist Board and the government. And I, while I was working there, another lady was talking about the fact that she'd just done the exams for the Institute of Public Relations. And I said, well, hey, you know, I've been doing public relations in Jamaica. Let me try and do the exams. And I did. And that gave me my first qualifications as a graduate of the Institute of Public Relations. So I took the qualifications to the boss and he said, okay, and upgraded me and gave me the job of the PR officer for the Jamaica Tourist Board account. And that was very nice. That was like, you know, a step up, a step up, another step. And in that capacity, I started doing things like writing articles. I had an article in Queen Magazine about Jamaica. I had a lovely spread in the color magazine of the Sunday Times. They, they did food from different countries and I got to do Jamaican food. I cooked some rice and peas and chicken and that was really nice. I even made a coconut cream pie. And that gave me an entrance into Fleet Street journalism, which was really nice as a journalist to be there, to be working for the Sunday Times. I did quite a few articles for them. They had a nice series called Me and My Money where they would interview celebrities about their money. Among the people I interviewed was Sammy Davis Jr. That was very nice. Oh. And um, Jacqueline Suzanne, who wrote the book Valley of the Dolls, she was really nice. I remember her giving me a gold ring. The ankh was her symbol, I remember that. And I remember her having the most fabulous coat, which was a trench coat, but it was lined in mink. And she brought it out to show me. I remember that being like, wow. <laughs> That's really something that celebrity wear. So when I heard that Thames Television, a new station was starting up in London and they would need journalists, I applied for a job as a journalist. And they asked me to come in and do an interview. Sure, I went along. And that interview was live. And they gave you some questions. They gave me three things. They gave me I had to read off a tele teleprompter and the this subject had Spanish words and French names. Then they gave you three subjects to choose one to do a piece to camera. I chose the 100 year old woman, lady who just had her 100th birthday. And then to interview someone and I had to interview a white man who said he was a, a, a soldier, a, a high, a hired soldier in the Biafra War in Afri in Nigeria. And I was really, I mean, to interview such a man, what were you doing there? What are you doing there? I mean, what right have you to be there? You know, and on whose side are you fighting? Anyway, I went away thinking, well, at least I've shown them that I can write. Um, oh, oh, the interview, the hundred year old woman, I made a joke, which made them laugh. I said, when asked how she managed to live so long, she said, I didn't bathe much. A little water never hurt. A little dirt never hurts unless it fell on you. And I hear the studio laughed and that made them all realize, you know, I was okay. And about three weeks later, I got a call saying, we'd like you to be in the studio. I thought, well, cool, because I'd done some stuff like that in Jamaica. There was a quiz show and there were live television commercials and sometimes I got to read the news. So no big thing. And I went along for my job. I was so astonished. It made the front page of every British newspaper. When the journalists, when we would take me into the room with Eamon Andrews and the other two was a girl journalist and a man, the journalists all rushed out of the room and they all went to file their stories. 
was on the front page of every newspaper except the Daily Express, which then had a rule that black people should not be on their front pages. <laughs> So that's kind of the story of how I came to be on the, the first journalist on, black journalist on British television, I should say. And what was that experience like being a black, uh, prominent on-screen talent at such a divisive time? I didn't know, really. It was what happened to me as I was doing the job that made me realize how different it was. Because, I mean, don't forget now, by then I'd had four years of being black in Britain. So you kind of knew how people would expect you. I mean, my first job was to do something in, in the East End, some gang affair, gang shooting. And I thought, oh, goodness, they're going to... But they were very nice. They were quite cool to me. They didn't mind at all. You know, those kind of people were okay. But sometimes you'd go somewhere and people would be like, oh, the black person. And you'd be like... That's weird. But the people who came into the studio were quite fine. You know, we, I remember Jack Benny once, we had to interview him. Sir Francis Chichester, who was the first man to sail unaided around the world. And the cat who ate oysters. I mean, I hate oysters. We had to interview all these people. But you just did it, you know. It was my job to speak to people. And I enjoyed that very much. We, we had researchers who would research the story and they'd say, well, Barbara, this is the angle I think you should take on this. And this is some information about the person or about the, the, the newsworthy item that you need to know. And then maybe we'd sit with the producer. I had a very nice one named Alex Valentine. We'd sit with him and he'd say, well, do it like this. And I'd like to hear about this and so on. So you'd get guidance. But basically, it was left up to you. And, you know, the studio people would be counting you down to come out of the interview and you'd see this camera's on or that camera's on or, you know. But it was just the work. And I did it. I did it. It wasn't hard. <laughs> now, at the risk of uh, asking an obvious question, what was the reception you got from white audiences? Well, this is when... This is what I discovered. First of all, I discovered many, many, many years later, like when I'm living in Jamaica now, that black people actually were glad and very proud to see me on television screens. But they never once thought of writing in a letter or phoning in to say that, which would have balanced out the fact that white people were calling in and saying, get that nigger off our screens. They said it just like that. And I didn't even know, I didn't know until it was coming up to be time for my contract to be renewed. I had initially a nine month contract. And I was called to a meeting one day with the other producer who was a woman, I forget her name. And they said, Barbara, we won't be renewing your contract because the audience, you know, is objecting to you. And they even showed me letters people had written in. Well, I was just astonished, but it's their country. I know they don't like black people. And I mean, that was just the beginning of the 60s. Angela Davis and the Black Panthers, Malcolm X, that was just happening. That consciousness and that education of myself as a black person was just beginning to happen. The Supremes had just made hits over Bob Dylan, you know? Black music was just rising up. Jimi Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock and blew everyone's mind. The Beatles had gone to India. Make Love Not War, the, the American kids were, fat, were protesting the Vietnam War and Jermaine Greer, an Australian writer, who happened to be a good friend of mine. She had written The Female Eunuch, the book that liberated women, all women, black, white, big, small, young, old. And my consciousness was just opening. So I had no way to object or feel any way different. May, I may have thought it as I sat down and read about what was happening with Angela Davis, George Jackson. Maybe I was thinking, but it was just growing gradually. I just accepted it. 
um, a few months later, I had an agent, in fact, the same agent as David Frost, I, which was nice, nice lady. She got me a job with ATV in Birmingham. And Birmingham, well, I didn't realize how much racism was in Birmingham, but Birmingham was the home of Enoch Powell, who was the man who really exacerbated race relations in Britain in the 60s. He's the man who said that if, if more immigrants were allowed in from the Caribbean, the rivers would run with blood. Rivers of blood was his most famous speech. And at the time when they had an immigration debate in parliament, people rioted, the dockers lined up outside in protest against more black people being allowed in. Ian Smith in, in Rhodesia, it was then called, had declared universal declaration of independence saying, this is a white country and I'm now the prime minister. And it was just a, a razor's edge we were walking on as black people. You didn't know, I mean, in the bus, no one wanted to sit next to you. You didn't take the tube because, you know, nobody wanted to touch you. It, it was a really hard time, the 60s, to be black in Britain. But what was happening the liberation of people's minds through, as I said, things like the music the Beatles was making, the swinging 60s, the young people in Britain identified with what was happening in white America, make love, not war. Make love, not war. That was all, it wasn't just a sexist statement or a sexual statement. It was about love, as in love of humanity, real love make love, not war. And the whole of that movement, the liberation of women, gave me a, a basis on which to stand as a free person, which was really nice, you know? And by the time, um, I mean, I remember in Birmingham, I, wasn't, I couldn't get a room at the hotel. I still had my flat in London, but I had to take the train up to Birmingham every morning, Monday to Friday to do the program and back down at nights because I, no hotel would rent me a room. Finally, I got a room in the YWCA, which was like the place where weird ladies stayed. And I was one of the weird ladies. And I would sleep there at night and still come back to London at weekends. So I wasn't sad when my contract at ATV Birmingham ended. But after that, I got a really nice job with the BBC, with Man Alive. I don't know if they still have Man Alive as a program now, but it was the 24 hours, uh, 60 minutes. It was the current affairs program of the week on BBC. Very excellent. Um, Desmond Wilcox was the producer, a very famous BBC producer. And working on that program was really nice. It was the most prestigious program on BBC television. And I was really honored to be on it. I learned a lot about production. I wasn't a, 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 an in-camera person then. I was behind the camera. I was in producer training, let's say. Um, we did, my first film was, on, was a, a story on old age pensioners. And the staff said, oh, Barbara, they've really given you a doozy that one. That's one a hard story to do. But I found it interesting because Going and finding these old people to interview made me see what my life would be like as an old person in Britain. I think that's what made me want to come back home to Jamaica more than anything, to see that that would be my life. And it wasn't a pretty life at all. But the second film, the second story we did was a co-production with Time Life on the Cannes Film Festival, which came about by my suggestion because I had filmmaker friends, um, the Merchant Ivory film producers, James Ivory and Ismail Merchant. Ismail was an Indian, James an American. They made some excellent films. They had a film in the Cannes Film Festival and they were really my good friends. And they said, hey, Barbara, we've got a film in the Cannes Film Festival. Why doesn't your program do a, a film? So said, so done. So we went to Cannes and did a film on the Cannes Film Festival. And that was really nice. That was really nice. Being in Cannes, you know, and seeing filmmaking at its very best. I mean, I'm a film fan from way back and going to the movies in England had been the real pleasure of my life. 
seeing films from all over the world in all different languages, you know, just films. I love that. So the Cannes Film Festival was great. Um, as a result of that, when I got back to London, I got a call from Jamaica. And this was Chris Blackwell telling me that Perry Hensler just made the first Jamaican movie and they would like me to be the PR and this was the harder they come. And that was the door that opened up my way back to Jamaica. So that's, that was my eight years in England. And it was really time to go home. I had, my consciousness had been raised by Black America. And I was seeing myself as a Black woman. Being in Cannes as a Black woman was also very interesting. And I was able to be, I remember um, Marvin Gaye and those guys had hit records at the time. It was a time of Black, black music. And it was really nice because then somehow you were at a point where black culture had risen and was still rising. And there was I going back into the most black culture rising of all, Rastafari, through reggae music. So I'd had a perfect journey from Ladbrook Grove and, and the blackest, the blackest times for black people right up to the heights of our culture now, to reggae and Rastafari. It's, uh, interesting. it's interesting you mention uh, this burgeoning uh, black power movement in Britain. So like we saw with the arrival of Stokely Carmichael in 67, Malcolm X, obviously you were aware of it, but were you involved in uh, the black power radicalism? I couldn't be. It, it hardly existed in, in London. Um, you know, at the West Indian Students' Union were um, Black people, mostly Caribbean. But they were very much into socialist revolution, wanting to go back to their countries and help run the country, whether it was Jamaica, and many of them did, or Africa. Um, the Black Power movement, I mean, I remember going back through London in the 70s from a trip to Iraq. And that was the first time I met Linton Kwesi Johnson, and he had just did his book of poetry. But in the late 60s, Linton was a baby, you know what I mean? He hadn't written his, his you know, groundbreaking book of poems yet, but Brixton was getting, was gathering up fuel, um, racial fuel to produce the people that it did. I mean, Brixton was just, a place you went to if you wanted to buy Jamaican food, but it was a dangerous place. You know, it was a dangerous place to be, as dangerous as Ladbroke Grove. But what we had as black revolutionaries, we had Michael X, who decided to, he was a, a, a black slumlord, or he worked for this, the real slumlord, which, whose name was Rackham, I think, Rack, Rackman. And he was a real bad man. But he decided to, to try and act as a black revolutionary. And his fate, his life was a disaster. I mean, I feel sorry for what eventually happened to him. But his effort, you know, made all, we couldn't do anything with him walking around saying, I am, I'm going to be the, the black leader in, in Britain. That couldn't happen, you know. And as I say, we had some black Marxist Leninists who would be like George Padmore was their hero. Um, and so we, we would hear a lot about this in literary ways, but black power didn't manifest itself on the streets. The sixties was the time of swinging London. And because of the music, the racial, racial lines overlapped. It didn't matter anymore. The, the young people accepted black people because black people gave them their music, you know, um, and, and they were glad of that and gave them, black people put color on Carnaby Street. I mean, London, the shops had been gray or navy blue or maroon or black. Those were the colors you could get clothes in. But here came the Caribbean people and we brought colors and we brought life, you know especially with our music. 
So giving, giving the young people our music made them love us and everything changed. The skinheads adopted our fashion style, you know? So right there, the 60s, the swinging 60s was the start of the integration of black people into British life. But the integration hasn't gone far enough or deep enough. I came back to Britain 10 years after I left and the man who had been head of, of Thames Television when I was there, he'd been the chief producer, was now head of Channel 4, which was just starting. And I had to complain to him that since I'd left Britain, no one had replaced me. Not, there hadn't been another black person on British television. And that's when he said, well, Barbara, will you make a film for me? And I got to make my film Race, Rhetoric, Rastafari, because it was about the fact that the media still hadn't used its power to really integrate black and white as much as the music had. The music had done it, but the music can only go so far because it's just entertainment and it's fashions. But the media had a role to play. And I see the media still is not playing that role because no wonder little Meghan Markle left. You know, she just couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take it anymore. I find it very interesting, um, everything you were saying about Ladbroke Grove, because uh, I'm actually doing my history dissertation on the Mangrove trial. Okay, yes, and, yes. Um, yeah, what of, year was the Mangrove? That was yeah. 1970. Yes, it was, it was. Because I left England in 72, and I remember the whole issue just beginning to happen. Yes, the Mangrove Five. And Tell me some more about what you're doing, yes. Because I'm doing an oral history interview, I've been um, lucky enough to speak with some of those who were involved with the Black Panther movement. I recently interviewed Roy Saw. I, I don't know if you remember Roy I do the name only, yes. Um, Leela Howe. Uh, she was called Leela Hassan back then. That uh, was, used to be married to Dark as hell. Yes, darkest, yeah. Yes. The, the Black Power people I knew were people like um, Rose, who ran the Black Bookshop. The Black Bookshop was the revolutionary place to be. New Beacon um, Books, was it? Huh? Was it New Beacon Books? Yes, New Beacon Books was the publisher. But there was a bookshop called the, um, I forget the name of the bookshop, but if it might have been New Beacon Bookshop. But that's where the revolution took place. And as I say, it was most, it was a lot of it was socialist and Marxist Leninist, which was another thing altogether that you didn't quite understand. I mean, yes, you knew about Cuba, but you, you know, you know that Cuba was a negative or you knew about Paul Robeson and his time in Russia, but you, it wasn't integrated. That's why what ha happened to the Mangrove Five was such an issue because this was the first time black people were speaking out and speaking up and, and being revolutionary, inspired by the Black Panthers in America. Definitely, that's something uh, that's come across from all the people that I've spoken to, that they really did look up to the Angela Davis um, back then and Stokely Carmichael's yes. speech at right. the Roundhouse. That was yes. incredib an incredible moment for the Black Power Movement in Britain. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Well, she's still my heroine, you know? She is the greatest, the greatest. To me, she and Winnie Mandela are the two greatest black women ever lived. True revolutionaries. I wish I could be even half like them. You know, because of them, I can be bold and daring. I can write things that other people... I mean, my poor little son, sometimes he says, Mommy, be careful, you know? Because I, 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 I'm very outspoken, very, very outspoken. I think I have a right to be. The life I've lived has given me the right to be. My father was a very outspoken journalist. I, I've inherited that right from him. And from him, I learned how to write diplomatically, to say what I wanted to say in a diplomatic way that it doesn't matter whether you agree or not. I haven't been rude. I haven't been offensive. I haven't called you out to revolution 
but I have spoken my piece. Do you understand? Yes. Now I'll backtrack to the documentary you mentioned just a second ago, um, your 1982 documentary, uh, Race, Rhetoric and Rastafari. And I was watching it in preparation for this interview and there was one section that really stood out to me where you spoke about how when you were working in Birmingham, you'd go to program meetings and uh, some of the TV crew would mention, would talk in a racist manner about black people. So using the term wog or troublemaker. Yeah. Yeah. And what I was wondering was, do you think that when they were using those words in front of you, they categorized you in the same group or do you think they saw you as the good black or different from the rest? <laughs> well, I'm sure I might have got the job as a good black, but they all certainly, I was, they would say, so what's the world story today? That's how they would do it, you know? Um, and poor stupid me, I, 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 I was, I'd been bred to not be offended. You know what I mean? I didn't know that Zimbabwe existed. I, they would say, well, if black people were so great, how come they never painted the Mona Lisa? I didn't know that Egypt was built by people the same color as me, that they painted on their walls the same color as me. I thought Egypt was Elizabeth Taylor, you know, and Richard Burton. I thought Egyptians looked like them. I didn't know. So when they'd say, what's the world story today? I would just look around wondering, well, who has it today? Who's doing what today that's going to put black people down? I hope it's not me again. You know what I mean? Once they said, oh, we want you, there was a white girl as a reporter too. We want you both to swim across the pool. Me with my straightened hair, of course, would just hold my chin up as I swam across. But I'd swum across the harbor at 15. I'd swum across the Kingston Harbor. I was that good a swimmer. So for whatever reason they wanted, you know, I just swam along. I get to the student and discover the story is black people can't swim as well as white people because I don't know whatever reason it was, but that was the story that evening. Mm -hmm. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know. I mean, it sounds like such a toxic work environment. But darling, it still is for black people in Britain. It still is. There's just another way to put them down. You know, I, I couldn't live there now. I couldn't live there. I couldn't live anywhere but my black Jamaica because in Jamaica, we're the majority. Jaja gave us a beautiful little place to live. And if we just were to get ourselves together, we all could make a living here so easily. They should give land to everybody because when slavery finished, we got no land, you know. And we've got acres and acres of beautiful land that needs food to be grown on it so people like you in England can get it to eat. Because when coronavirus is over, you're all going to need food. What's happening? What's happening? You know? So, I mean, I'm happy to be in Jamaica. I'm happy to be a Jamaican. I wouldn't change it for the world. I still have a British passport, thanks to Mr. Enoch Powell, because when he was ranting and raving about they should all go back, I was one of those who listened when they said, all those who came here on old British passport apply now for British citizenship. Those who didn't became the people who got sent back in this Windrush scandal. But I applied for my British passport and I still have it. And I can travel anywhere in the world. I can live anywhere in the world I want to with that British passport. But I only want to live right here where when I get to the airport in Kingston, I show them my Jamaican passport and they say, okay, you're a Jamaican, come in. You know, that's cool with me. When I get to the other side, I'll take out my British passport and show, yes, yes, I have a right to come in here. But I love being Jamaican. And I, I mean, any Jamaican who's listening, who can find a way to come and live here and spread your talents here and grow your children here and give all this great things you've learned in Britain here, I would encourage you all to come to Jamaica, please, you know? We don't have too much population, you know? You should see when you drive in the country, 
how much land there is. Please come and help develop it now. Come and put, uh, just come and help develop it some more now. We've had to appeal to the, the IMF again yesterday, the government did, because they've given out so much money in this corona, coronavirus. They've given out money to everybody who's been unemployed because of it, to all the students. He, they put up nursing homes. They, they've spent so much money trying to cushion what's happening. And like all, all the other countries have done, it's happened in Britain. But we now have to go back to the IMF for money. That's really sad. I want to see us get back on our feet as fast as possible because Jamaica is paradise on earth. It really is, darling. It really is. Yes. <laughs> A very proud Jamaican, I see. Yes, yes, yes. I've had the experience, you know. Britain has taught me how great it is to be Jamaican, really. And when I was um, watching your documentary, I watched it this morning, actually. Uh, another thing that really stood out to me was this journey to black consciousness that you were speaking about, that you came to. And there was one line in it where you said you had given up on the idea of cultural assimilation. And I was wondering if you could talk to me about that journey that you underwent. How do you mean, give, I said I'd given up on black uh, in the documentary, you mentioned how um, you said how eye-opening Franz Fanon's book, Black Skin, White Mask, was. And uh, you said that it had proven to you, your time in Birmingham especially, that cultural assimilation didn't mean anything. That cultural assimilation does, is not, is not going to happen? Is that what I said? <laughs> yeah, you said it wasn't the way to free yourself as a black person to assimilate. Oh. No, it's because it's kind of impossible. You can go so, <clears throat> excuse me, so far along that road, but there comes a dead end point where you can no longer blend. It's not like stirring coffee. <clears throat> There's a point where you have to just be your full self. <clears throat> um, I don't know how to explain it better because it makes it seem like I'm saying you must be racist. And I'm not saying that at all. Um, you, you, you must take your full humanity as people of other races take their full humanity. The, the white person is born with a feeling of all rightness. I won't even call it racial superiority, but they just know from birth that they're all right, their way, everything is all right. We need to get to that position. And th that's the position when we will be accepted. Bob Marley said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. And that's really what we need to do. Most of us are not emancipated. You know, it's like I have a, a, a lady friend on Facebook. She's just come on recently. We have a lot in common. She lives in New York. She goes to the ballet. I love the ballet. Um, she, she travels around the world. I love travel. But I saw her put up something on her page at Easter. And I just had to stop posting on her page because she put up white Christ. And she put up a post about the white angel. And there's this white person with blonde hair dressed in white. And I liberated myself from that so long ago. I, I learned that Christ is black. Marcus Garvey taught me that. And then the Rastas made me see that through the personification of Emperor Haile Selassie. And then Emperor Haile Selassie, his whole Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity is of black icons, black Madonna and Christ, black, black icons in the churches. It being the oldest Christian church in history from, from chapter eight in Acts of the Apostles you know, Ethiopia has been worshiping the Christus. So to see her still stuck in that white brainwashing makes me unable to put up a post on her page anymore. I can like her page, but whereas I used to come on and have little chats, it's like, I can't because I can't 
have it seem that I endorse her in that format. And what I should do is find some gentle way to teach her. But all I can do, I remember the day I saw that, I went and put up a, a, a video of the OJ singing Ship Ahoy. Ship Ahoy, Ship Ahoy, Ship Ahoy. But the song begins with the sound of, of a boat creaking and the sails flapping and the whip. And that's what the song says. This, I can't bear the sound of the whip. And I put that song up in the hope that she could listen to it and see why I can never anymore endorse that whiteness because the, the whole story of my being here, of my being in America or in England, begins with the crack of the whip on that slave ship. And I can never ever forget the history of those people that has created the history of my people. And many of them see how wrong their history is and have turned themselves to make compensation and compensation if it's even only just in love. But I, my eyes are open. I, the chains are off my brain from the 70s, from my first heard, and from the 60s, Angela Davis and Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Rastafari, Emperor Haile Selassie. So what I'm saying is you have to find your full black self and live in that full black self, just like you live in your own house. And next door is a nice house with nice neighbors and you and them talk regularly. You go to tea there and they come over and have ackee and saltfish in your house. But that's two different houses. Occupy your house fully because they occupy their house fully and meet as equals and as friends, not as inferior and superior. And until you occupy your full black self, you will always be inferior. You always will be. And plenty of us have a lot of white blood in them. I don't know if you can see. My mother was a very fair-skinned lady. She movie star kind of looks. So I have a mix. My father was a full black African man. And I have that mix. But nothing is ever, England taught me, no, Barbara, you're not half white. You're black. So any one of you, look at Meghan Markle. I go there again, you know. The lady has never denied being a black person. And we have so many Jamaicans who are just as white skinned as she is. But that drop of black blood in her, they will never let her forget. She will always be treated differently, regarded differently, treated with scorn, with contempt, with anger. So, you know, take your fullness, take your full black self, like Megan did. Her husband always wanted to live in Africa. He was so glad he found a beautiful black woman. Let them say what they want to say. I'm so glad they stepped away, you know, truly. Don't take racism. Don't take it half served. Don't, don't take half likes. Take the full, take it full, take it full. And anytime you get vexed, save up your money and go live in a black country. It's not perfect. England isn't perfect either. Go live in a black country. There are lots of little islands down there that are so cute. Have no problem. Would love someone like you living there. Cute is the word I can say. Not tough like Jamaica, you know. Jamaica's not cute. <laughs> so take your pick. Take your pick. You know, get out, man. Be, be a majority. Be a majority. Beyonce and her husband come here, they love it. Black people. They drive around Trench Town and do their video. And some people go, oh, hi, big me. Hi, Jay-Z. Hi, Beyonce. Nobody's beating down their door and run. Because, well, we've seen celebrities, you know, we have our few, we have Usain Bolt, we have Bob Marley, we have Jimmy Cliff, we have some celebrities, okay. Ah, nice to see you, Beyonce. Hey, Kanye, how nice. Live in a black country, no?
come live in a black country when it gets too much for you when you the last person has spat on you just spend six months in a black country you know? just even if it's just six months yeah and on the subject of uh, Meghan markle like you brought up just a second ago we see that not only does she deal with uh, racism but also sexism and my next question to you is do you think your identity as a woman added an additional challenge when you were in Britain? Yes. You know, I'm not one of those women who was pretty first and then intelligent second. I always had to be intelligent first. So I hardly ever noticed I was pretty. It's years after I might look at a picture and say, well, or people would say, but Barbara, you were, they, I never was told this at the time, oh, you're pretty or beautiful or whatever, because I was always being on the brain power level. But I realize now that looking good is always valuable. Um, Harry wouldn't have noticed Megan if she wasn't pretty, because there are plenty of girls light skin brown who aren't pretty either. Um, I'm sure that the fact that, uh, that the producer who worked with me was a man liked the fact that I was pretty, whatever. But he liked most of all that he could sit down and have an intelligent conversation with me. And I've always been fortunate in that respect, that things I've done have been because of my intellectual abilities, not because I was pretty. Um, I, I was appointed a senator because of letters to the editor that I wrote. And I mean, I immediately got pregnant and was pregnant for the first nine months I was a senator. So it was nothing to do with any pretty face sitting on the opposite side. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be sexism rules. But I've also been fortunate that one person I've worked with a lot and I'm working with once again is the Lady Minister of Culture and Entertainment, um, Minister Olivia Babsy Grange. And I met her first when I was a senator. So was she. She was a government senator in charge of culture. I was opposition. But we, we moved very well together because of culture. And she's always been someone who was, you know, there have been assignments. She's given me numerous assignments. Now I'm the consultant mainly to do with Rastafari affairs, cultural affairs. But therefore, working with her, there's no sexism involved at all. It's really nice to have a woman boss. But I, I've worked with men, yes, and I see situations, not in job, but in life, where if I had just played the pretty girl role, uh, role, I would have got this or that. But at the end of the day, I'm glad not to have gone that road because I see the road that other girls went and what happened to them. And here I am, you know, coming up to 80 years old, still in good nick, they might say, and highly respected. I've received several awards of, you know, of honor, the order of distinction of Jamaica being the highest, but Ethiopian Crown Council has awarded me, my, my school that I went to, um, the Black British Entertainment Film and Television Artists. I've been awarded not because of being a woman and definitely not for being pretty in any way. The only award I get for being pretty is my little son <laughs> who will love me and will say, oh, my pretty mommy. But, you know, other than that, I don't really get it. Because of how I dress, when I walk on the street, men don't call out sexy comments to me. Men say to me, oh, my queen, I wish I had a wife like you. That's what they say to me. Is a queen like you, may I look, you know, sister, empress, mama. You know, that's what I get on the street. So I don't have to worry at all. Rastafari taught me that. It says dress in such a way that you don't rise up the sap in a man. And that's a very important lesson for a woman to learn. Because you, you get into a lot of trouble when you rise up the sap in a man. You have to be able to deal with it. As a woman, I say this woman to woman, and it's not easy to deal with men when you rise up the sap in them. Some women are wise. Some women are cunning, crafty. 
But most of the time, we're just helpless fools who are flattered, easily flattered. And men know this, so they aim their gun of flattery and subdue so many innocent women who are who think who are vain enough to think that beauty is something valuable. Beauty goes so quickly, so easily. You know, it's irrelevant. <laughs> There's a Judd Judy quote that uh, sums us up very well. She says, stupid lasts forever, beauty fades. Exactly, 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 exactly. It's something well worth remembering. And I knew that long ago, I tell you, long, long, long ago. Yes, yes, yes. My mother was very beautiful, you see. So I, I never, I guess I had an inferiority complex because I'd never be as beautiful as my mother, you know what I mean? So I never had any beauty problems at all. You know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And I've avoided sexism. I know that. I know that. I mean, good friends I have. Good friends I have. I, I must call Beverly Manley's name again. Beverly Anderson, she was. Married the Prime Minister Michael Manley. These are all my good friends, you know. On the one hand, Minister Babsy Grange. On the other hand, Beverly Manley. They're my good girlfriends, you know what I mean? And I have lots of white girlfriends as well, you know. I have lots of friends of all colors. I have lots of white friends who are real friends. My friends, you know what I mean? I, I have friends, I have friends who are blind. Stevie Wonder is blind and he's my friend. He don't know whether I'm pretty or not. He just knows in this conversation with me, he likes me. He doesn't know what I look like. You know what I mean? Yeah, Stevie Wonder is my friend. <laughs> Yes, yes. And when you were working uh, as a journalist here in Britain, what was the office environment like? Did you feel that you had other women there who had your back? Or did you feel you were just out there on your own? You mean as a TV journalist? Yeah. Yes, I had girlfriends in the office and male friends in the office. Um, but women's consciousness wasn't as acute then. Jermaine Greer had just written her book. That was the book that liberated women in Britain and around the world and made us realize we, we had, you know, a rights, consciousness, a right to be a woman and the rights of equality, rights of motherhood and rights of, of not being mothers. She was really the pioneer that, that freed our minds as women. But she, her book was what, 68, 69, thereabouts it was published. We were just becoming we were just becoming aware, you know? Yes. And when you look, well, when you turn on TV today in Jamaica or when you see British TV, what do you think when you see black and brown females and men on TV thinking back to the tough time you endured? I am so through because a lot of them communicate with me, you know. They write to me, send me messages, do little interviews, little chats quite a few of them and it's such a pleasure it's a delight i mean i i see them and i'm just astonished i i see quite a few of them there's one who broadcasts africa stories um there are quite a few it's i just i just smile and nod my head you know it's it's happened it, but it had to happen finally you know i i hear from their accents that they're very well educated they probably went to oxford or What's the other one? Cambridge. You know, you can tell from how they speak that their upbringing and everything has given them, has opened the doors up into the, you know, journalism portals, journalism spaces. So I'm really glad of that. I hope the Daily Mail employs a few. If so, where? Good heavens, you know? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, yeah. we're all part of your legacy. You were yes. the first. You, definitely. All you young black journalists, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. Those are the freedoms, you know, we all have in this world. Make them send, I mean, find a way to come and do a story in Jamaica. It would really do you a lot of good. Let some of your research bring you to Jamaica. Because just like all of us felt we had to see Britain or Europe or America, we had to come out of our home and see the rest of the world, 
same way you all have to. Britain is a little teeny place, you know, it's gotten smaller since Brexit. You need to come out of that small place and see the wider world. See, I mean, you know, when famous black people come to Jamaica, what amazes and impresses them most is to see a country where everything is black people. Every single thing is black people from the top to the bottom. Even the policemen, you know, it's good to see those things. The rich and the poor are all one color. Yeah, there are a couple of white people at the top, yeah. But still so many black people. The richest Jamaican man is a mixture of African and Chinese. There's no white in Mr. Michael Leachin at all. He flies his helicopter from the airport to land on top of his building, the building he owns when he comes to work in Jamaica. He lands in his private jet, then his helicopter picks him up at the airport and drops him on the top of his building. And he's Negro Chinese. Usain Bolt, you know what I mean? Those are the people we look up to. And of course, the richest one of all, Bob Marley, you know? So you all need to make a little trip out, all you black journalists. I will happily host you. I've got a spare bedroom. You can come and stay. <laughs> oh, that's very kind. I might have to take you up on that offer. Anytime, anytime. You're all welcome. Just give me advance notice. <laughs> now, over here in Britain, even today, there's still a lot of uproar about the lack of diversity and lack of inclusion on TV, be it news, be it entertainment. In your estimation, do you think that Black people should try and create their own platforms and their own media networks where they can go to or do you think it's better for them to seek inclusion into no, the dominant? to do both definitely definitely creates some of our own media that's very very important i listen to the bbc a lot especially at night you know i keep it on, on beside my bed and there's so few black stories they hardly ever do any story to do with jamaica there's so few black stories. It's a very interesting radio station. I've learned a lot of things about the world, about poets and musicians and countries and issues. You know, I know what it's like when uh, the trans people who change sex and want to change back to the sex that they originally were. I've learned so many things, but so little about Africa and very, almost nothing about Jamaica. And so many things are happening. So much is happening in this part of the world. You know, it would be good to have more of a mixture. So you all need to start some of your own stations, your own magazines. I mean, there needs to be a British essence. Why isn't there a British essence? You've got Naomi Campbell. You've got, um, what's that lady? She's now become the Marchioness of Bath, um, what's her name? That black um, Marchioness. Um, yeah, I, I know the one you're talking about, yeah. Yes, I mean, you've got a lot that you could put in, in a black essence and you had Megan, you had Megan. <laughs> you need a black radio TV station, definitely. And I don't see why you don't. I mean, you should be able to find investors from Africa and the Caribbean to invest in such a station. You should try, you should try. Something that we are seeing is um, a growth of independent platforms. So such as podcasting and YouTube, a lot of black content creators are now seeking to make their own content without going through the traditional routes of- That's good. Well, there you have the start of a TV station because black content is all you need. Regular black content. And it, it, that's very good news. I'm very glad to hear that. Yes, press on, do that. Please, please, please. I think that's great, that's great. Now, when you see the recent Brexit debate and the Windrush scandal, and even recently we've had um, a lot of controversy about the disproportionate amount of death of black and brown people with this COVID-19 pandemic. When you look at all of that going on in Britain, do you really think Britain has developed since you left? I wouldn't say developed. Britain can't change. You know, you've got your queen. 
it's it's still the same history. Britain can't change. Britain can't would have to change from the top, and it's not going to happen right away. You know, I, I don't even want to talk. Britain can't change. Britain can't change until it apologizes for slavery, and that's the day it would recognize its great crime to black people. And when it does recognize that, it will gain some humility. And with humility, change will come. It won't happen till Britain apologizes. We ask for reparations. I know that Britain is never, ever going to pay black people. They can't, Britain can't afford to. It would bankrupt the entire country. The debt to all the black people that Britain that are a result of British slavery. The debt is unpayable. But an apology would be really cool. But an apology would have to come out of, out of humility, out of great humility. And I don't see that humility. If there was humility, Meghan wouldn't have had to leave. There is no humility. You know, so it's just gonna have to continue for a while. Thank you for joining me. Mm -hmm.